Hello and welcome to 18 WJTS Inform. I'm your host, Bill Potter. We are very honored to have in the studio with us today State Senator Mark Mesmer, District 48. And uh, the Senator comes in on Fridays and will be coming in every Friday from here on out through the legislation. But today he's here on this Monday to talk about things that have been going on so far. Senator, welcome to the show. Well, great to be here as always. Always nice to keep the, the folks in, in uh, District 48 up to date on what's happening at the State House. Well, first, let's, you've got a lot of bills, but we're going to talk, first of all, I guess, about the bills that are being talked about the most in the Senate right now, and okay. then we'll talk about your bills. So okay, perfect. Give us kind of a rundown of what's happened so far. All right. Well, as we've dealt with the last couple of years, we're going to continue to have more focus on the opioid uh, addiction issue, uh, trying, trying to find more ways to tighten up uh, you know, prescription over abuse, uh, tracking the prescriptions more diligently, you know, having all doctors uh, participate in what they call the uh, inspect system where they, you know, when you uh, ask for a prescription, they need to check to make sure you're not already getting a prescription from someone else on the same thing to prevent uh, doctor, you know, hopping, shopping, whatever. Right. Um, and then uh, on workforce development issues, Really going to drill down on, you know, the governor had some ideas on how to get, you know, workforce development uh, accomplished better. And Senator Eckerty's got a really uh, interesting bill on that in dealing with how to get, you know, retraining of adult workers or, or you know, kids coming out of high school looking for a career tech education training, uh, you know, using a model that Tennessee uh, has implemented several years back. Um, that, that's going to allow you know people to go in to get specific uh, tech education training in as fast as a year and be eligible for Pell Grants and be eligible for uh, 21st Century and O'Bannon Scholarship funds to, to, to pay for that at, so they can get out of school quicker with the education they need you know specifically for the tech education they're looking for and get out of it debt free. Uh, really, a, really a very uh, exciting opportunity we've got to you know, enhance that. Um, and, and taking that out of the Department of Workforce Development and setting up basically a career tech education uh, um, department that's, that, that's not, they're not going to be under higher education, they're not going to be under workforce development. It would be kind of a parallel track, you know, that, that you know, they would have their own career tech education, you know, folks heading that up. And, and really, I guess that's the, way, the idea is to get them into the workforce quicker because uh, we're at low unemployment. Low unemployment. Low unemployment. And, we need and, workers, and, and we need you know we need more skilled workers. There's still a lot of un, unfilled skilled positions that you know just lacks the manpower or, or the people trained you know properly to take them. So that's a pretty exciting idea. Another bill we've got Senate Bill 189 is going to be some additional funding, about nine million dollars to the you know K through 12 education. This past year, they we always take the numbers they give us on what they anticipate their enrollment to be. And historically, they're pretty close within fractions of a percent. Mm -hmm. Well, this year we had, I think, you know, 3,000 more students showed up for school than what any of them anticipated. So we've got about, a, I think, about a nine million dollar, uh, you know, budget uh, supplemental bill that you know that we're going to add to that. So if they had more students show up than, than they anticipated, that we've got the money there to, to fund that. And because basically that is that the uh, state government gives schools so much money per child. Right. And so you've so, got more kids, you've got to have more money. Gotcha. Right. Yep, okay. exactly. Uh, Senate Bill 99 deals with civil forfeiture. And, and it, a lot of times if, if you know, police arrest somebody and they're in the middle of a drug, uh, you know, drug deal and they've got cars and cash and guns, you know, things like that, you know, the you know, law enforcement you know, when that, when that person's arrested, you know, those, those uh, things are put in, you know, that civil forfeiture, you know, it is used, you know, you know, as part of the evidence. And then if they're convicted, you know, then those, those, you know, personal property items are, you know, forfeited to the state. Uh, but it, re it puts up some, I guess, some boundaries for law enforcement that you've got to have, uh, you've got to have, you know, due cause, you have to have, you know, you know, they have to be suspected of a felony before you can you can just you know impound their property, and then if they are ultimately you know you know found to be innocent, you know some quicker ways to get those those personal property items back to the owner. Okay. So you know a good balance between uh, law enforcement's needs and private property rights, and then Senate Bill One, the other big item that that will be dominating the news probably is the you know Sunday alcohol sales. Mm -hmm. And that bill was heard in the Senate and House Public Policy Committees. Uh, House has their version. I'm not sure what the number is, but ours is Senate Bill 1. And both passed out of their committees, I think, unanimously in the House and Senate. 
public policy last Wednesday, so they'll both be on the, the floor for second reading and third reading uh, this week, and then those bills will you know, swap chambers and do the same thing in the second half of session. But uh, really don't anticipate any, any major problems with you know, Sunday sales finally coming to fruition this year. Well, we've talked about this for years and years and mm -hmm. years and years, mm -hmm. and, and uh, so and this moving pretty quick, very really. quickly. It was yes. one of the first bills both both you know public policy committees heard this week, and it was a straight agreement. You know, if you can sell alcohol now at the retail level, you'll be able to sell it on Sunday, and they're they're going to limit the hours from noon to eight. Was is about the only only caveat to that. Which I, if I think a lot of the neighboring states that have that, mm -hmm. that is part of the similar. thing anyway. Yep, on on Sundays, similar. you can only buy it after a certain time. Right. Yep. Okay. Yep. So that's going to be, we'll have to watch that and see how that goes. Mm -hmm. Now, you yourself have been very busy. Yes, I've got, uh, I, I had 10 bills that I had filed, and then Senator Hirschman uh, you know, resigned from office to move out to Washington, D.C. right before session started. So I, I had inherited one of his bills as well. So I, now I have 11. Okay. Which is really... That's good. That's good. Yeah, you're it's, busy. It's right? going to be very busy. You're earning your money. That's right. <laughs> and, and the majority of these of my bills come from issues that pop up in the district. People who have problems, who you know, need solutions. I, I like to consider myself a problem fixer on deals, on deals like that. And so the majority of them you know, come from uh, you know, people right here at home you know, wanting something done you know, differently or better or, or you know, a, you know, adjusting you know, an existing law you know, most of the time. Uh, but, you know, what first bill I filed was, was uh, actually my first Senate Bill 160 was the first one that I had in, in line. And it's, it's update to the chiropractic uh, laws. Uh, they haven't been updated for 30 years. And the chiropractic rules are the only set of, of uh, you know, license or rules that are, that are based on what they can't do rather than what they can do. Okay. Um, not really anything significantly changing in, in how we're you know restructuring that set of, you know section of code, uh, but but may, instead of saying they can't they can't they can't you know and then trying to d adopt rules that that you know fit within the parameters of what they can't so this will be a listing of what they can do, and it more or less reinforces what they are already doing, but puts it in a, in a you know what they can like every other licensure law that what you know what they're allowed to do, working on some fine tuning of the wording so the doctors and the, and the, ortho, and the uh, um, physical therapists and the occupational therapists, you know, everybody agrees to how that wording is done. But in the end, it'll, it'll just uh, you know, be basically a restructuring of their, of their laws. Uh, one that I'm bringing back from last year is if you adopt a pet at a pet shelter, they're too young to be spayed or neutered. Um, starting in probably three years from now, it's, it's not taken effect for a while. But if you don't bring them back to be spayed or neutered when, when, you, you know, when you adopt them, you have to put down a $75 deposit. If you don't bring them back, you forfeit the deposit. If you bring them back then, then, and get them spayed or neutered, then that you know, spay and neuter is, is free. But if you decide, you know, I don't want that you know, done to my pet, then those forfeited funds, right now they're set to go into the pet-friendly plate fee, which is a voluntary contribution that you make, $25 or $30, that goes to Indiana Spay and Neuter Services. It's it's a sing, you know one company that administers funds to low cost you know for low cost spay and neuter services. But there's seven or eight other companies that do low cost spay and neuter. And my bill would take that forfeited forfeited fee and, and send it to the Board of Animal Health, and then let them distribute it to anybody that does spay and neuter services. Okay. I have no problem with a plant, pet friendly you know plate fund as as what as for what it's doing, but it's set up to have the money go to one company. And that's okay when it's a voluntary donation, just like if you were donating it to 4-H or Purdue or any other, you know, there's all kinds of, of uh, personalized plates you can buy with that are donations to, to specific organizations. But if it's a tax, it needs to go to a state agency to be made available to anybody. Okay. Uh, last year it had, uh, it allowed for a budget, uh, budget appropriation to go into that fund and so the House Ways and Means Committee decided they didn't want to hear it because it allowed for a, a state appropriation. So we pulled the state appropriation out of it this year and see if it has uh, better results. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a request from a lady in Spencer County who's an EMT, lives closer to Evansville than some of the people that currently qualify to apply for police or fire jobs. And, and currently, you know, the statute says if you want to apply for a, a city police or, or city fire department job, you have to be either, either within the county, 
that the city resides or a, an adjoining county that borders it. But she said, I live you know, probably 20 miles from Evansville, but I, you know, where I live is where Spencer County and Warwick County and Vandenberg County kind of come down to a point where they're really not very far apart. But she said, you know, I live closer than people that might live in Gibson County and, and qualify. So we added a 50 mile, you know, you can apply if you're within 50 miles of that, of that city as well and not in a non-adjoining county. And that's for police, firefighters, police and fire. EMTs? Uh, yes, okay. EMTs. Yeah. So it would, it would just allow them you know, to, to apply for the position. There's a lot of counties across the state. If you look, there's little, little bumps and little corners that stick mm -hmm. out. And you might only be 10 miles away from a county that's non-contiguous and, and not qualify you know, to apply for a position. So it seemed like a logical thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a bill that was passed a few years back requires any financial transaction at a, at a, at a real estate closing above $10,000 to be wired from, you know, from one bank to another. And it could be a situation here where an old national and German American bank you know, would have to wire money to each other rather than just write a certified check you know, and, and walk, across the walk across the street and deliver it. Uh, and, and the banks have really been you know, unhappy with that since it passed uh, and the realtors you know, have, have started to have uh, situations where, I mean, the actual wired transaction, you know, from point A to point B is pretty accurate. But what's happening, what's been happening in the last couple of years is, is scammers from across the ocean or out of the country have been, have been watching, you know, for postings of days of real estate closings. And they'll, they'll put together a, a fake email that looks just like an email, you know, sent to or from, you know, the institutions involved. And they'll send you know wiring information, you know, to one of the parties, and that money will get wired, and then it's it's sent, you know, out of the country and never to be captured again. So the you know the the fraud in in that in in those wiring instructions has become so prevalent. I think there was a realtor in Evansville that lost about fifty thousand dollars because of, of you know wire fraud uh, just in this past year. And so the realtors want it changed, the bankers want it changed, the, the credit unions want it changed, and even most of the title company owners want it changed. Now, the uh, title company association, you know, representative up there claims that that's really the only way that should still be done, but we voted on a committee uh, this past week unanimously to eliminate the mandate. Still allows it to, ha to be one of the choices, but, but leave it up to the institutions that are involved in that transaction. Almost every time a, a closing on a real estate transaction involves a person closing out one home loan and opening another home loan, and so they're going from bank to bank, and those banks can clearly identify what's the least risky, you know, most you know, secure way to, to transfer those funds. Sure. So, um, <clears throat> on school projects, uh, currently uh, you know, we operate in that, that realm of construction, and it's pretty typical uh, to see architects, architects and engineers specify only one vendor that can supply, you pick the item, lights, door hardware, carpet, HVAC units. I mean, everything on a building gets specified typically that only, only one, you know, one supplier can, can meet the specs. And when you know you're the only supplier that can meet the specs of a project, the costs typically go up. And I've seen, I've seen on you know, mechanical specs on school projects, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of you know, overpriced uh, you know, bids and nothing you can really do. Uh, so this, this bill, and I worked on this with the Architects and Engineers Association to get it in a, in a form you know, that, they, you know, that they felt comfortable with because they're usually the ones who would get to the committee chairman and, you know, and, and get the bill just not heard. You know, when I, when, this had been attempted in prior years, uh, but it, it requires that the architects and engineers specify, you know, th you know three vendors that can meet uh, anything that's supplied on a project, um, from the roof, you know, on down, R roof to carpet and everything in between. Now, if there are safety items, you, know, you might have a security system on a building, and you might want to have the same security system on all your buildings. You know, I mean, there's there's things where one vendor might be the most logical choice, uh, but on any specific item that a school board wants to, uh, you know, wants to approve the architect or engineer specifying only a one vendor item, 
each item needs to be discussed and debated on and voted on in a, in a, in a you know, public meeting at the school board. So it does allow for it, but I would, you know, I would expect that to be you know, in, in pretty unique situations where safety you know, issues or security issues are, are at stake. Other than that, it just doesn't make much logical sense and costs the taxpayer a fortune. Um, the, uh, an issue that came up out of uh, an auto body shop in uh, Petersburg, he was having problems with, with maybe the auto manufacturer requiring you know, six or eight items to be done on a repair you know, during a, a collision repair. And insurance companies saying, well, you know, we're not going to cover items three, four, and seven because, you know, we don't want to pay for it. And there's nothing that really requires an insurance company to, you know, to even do the things that the manufacturer you know, would, would specify in a, in a repair. So then that, that auto body shop is, is required, to, or he's either going to have to, you know, bill the customer in addition to what their insurance pays, and then the, you know, the customer's not happy. Mm -hmm or he doesn't do the repair properly and then he takes a, a big you know, liability risk or he does the repair correctly and doesn't get paid. Well, you know, I mean, the, either the consumer or the body shop is gonna come out on the short end of, of that you know, scenario. And, and my bill that I've got would require you know, that, that if there's a list of you know, specified repairs that you know, the insurance company has to cover it. They, they can't mandate, you know, use of, of you know, off-market or, you know, or second-tiered products. You know, I, I want to basically set this up to where it's the consumer's choice. The, the, auto, the insurer can't steer, you know, that repair to a, to a specific body shop. I mean, they can maybe base the amount of their, their repair, you know, on what the preferred vendor is going to, you know, going to be paid to do, but let that consumer take the vehicle wherever they want make sure that the, the insurance company doesn't, you know, deny covering a repair that the manufacturer, you know, requires and, and give, the, you know, give the body shop, you know, some, some liability protection and, and give the consumer a better product when the day's done. So, um, gonna have to work on that one a little bit the next week or two to get it, you know, get all the wording and get, every, you know, get the body shops and insurers, make sure everybody feels like they're, you know, they're getting, you know, things, you know, done correctly. Um, a bill that came up from our local uh, CASA, the Court Appointed Special Advocates. Uh, if, a, if a child is, is sexually molested in, in a family, then all of the kids in that family become, become what they call a, a, a child in need of service you know, des designation. But if a kid has a broken arm or broken collarbone from physical abuse, uh, currently that child is considered a chin's case and the other kids are not. And uh, one of my bills would, you know, in a, in a physical, uh, abuse situation that you know the kids the, all the kids in the family would, would would be treated the same as if there was a sexual abuse victim in that family so it just gives all the kids you know some some oversight uh, on the Airbnb issue really that's a, a short-term rentals is the actual term for it um, there was a city north of Indianapolis that had uh, started the process about a year ago to to ban the use of, of your your personal private property uh, you know, I'll, you know, ban completely the the, the uh, practice of what they call short-term rentals, or using Airbnb or VRBO as another you know online service. But whether they use an online service or not, they just they were just banning the practice completely. Uh, so we had a study committee last fall to debate the issue, and really broke it down into if it's my home that I claim a homestead credit on, then local government would not be able to prohibit use of my home as I want. If it's, a, if it's an investment property that I don't live in, that's not my primary residence, then they would have the ability to regulate and, and have either a permit process or a zoning variance process you know, for use of a, a, you know, an R1 or R2 you know, residential property for short-term rentals. Uh, as long as it can't have the net effect of banning you know, short-term rentals. Uh, issue that popped up out of uh, Huntingburg They've got the four street area that's considered a historic preservation zone. They're wanting to do the streets and sidewalks in that area. And since they're wanting to use only state money, no federal money, the State Department of Natural Resources has a historic preservation committee. Uh, prior to this bill taking effect, that committee only meets quarterly. And if they don't have a quorum and can't act, 
you might have a whole, you might have a six month or longer period that they can't process your your waiver or you know you know you, you know approve your project. And if it's streets and sidewalks, it's really it's really almost I mean never gonna denigrate the historic preservation of the buildings. Mm -hmm. That's what they're there. That that committee is there to to have oversight on the buildings, not the streets and sidewalks. But it, it's a review that the federal government does when there's federal funds in about 30 days. And we're just going to, and worked on this with DNR to get them a process to set up to get, to, get the, to get those applications approved in 30 days or less. And, and everybody's in agreement to do that. So that'll just speed up the construction you know, time on those, you know, the, you know, with Huntingburg, it was their stellar city program. Well, if they lost a year, they could, you know, they could eventually lose access to the funds. So um, good bill on that one. And then on residential property, I've got a bill that will ban, uh, you know, having, uh, allowing either cities and towns or even the state, you know, with, you know, the state um, building, um, building committee to require sprinklers in re residential property. Currently, they, there's none that have adopted it, but there's, there's starting to be discussions around the state, you know, to ha have some communities require sprinklers in their, in their, in their homes. And, and that's a very expensive proposition when you build, and it's a very expensive proposition to maintain. So uh, my bill would ban that unless the legislature in the future, you know, takes action to, you know, to approve it. But uh, would, would stop that, you know, at the ordinance level from happening. And then the last bill I inherited from Senator Hirschman, last year we had a bill that uh, it was to deal with small cells, the, the 5G technology that's, that's coming. I think Indianapolis and Evansville are going to be, you know, test communities, you know, for that 5G service. But it's, it's speeds on wireless service as fast as, as a gig. I mean, it's as fast as, you know, fiber optics would be, you know, the one gig program that we're working on here in Jasper. That, that type of speed at, at a wireless, uh, you know, phone level. Uh, well, there was a, I'll call it a drafting error when that bill was passed last year, and it left about a one-week gap between when the uh, when the s s legislature was done until the um, effective date of that, you know, rule that came up in dealing with, you know, how to regulate small cell uh, installations. And about 75 towns and cities across the state uh, passed resolutions that declared their entire city, you know, underground, underground utility installation only. Well, that's a that's about five times the in installation cost to run, you know, power or, you know, telecommunications underground compared to overhead, and and that was not the intent of the bill to allow those resolutions to happen, but but they did some creativity and entrepreneurial spirit of some people involved. Uh, so that bill would would roll that date back, you know, to prior to when session ended last year, uh, to not end up with, you know. 75 different waiver and ordinance and permit structures across the state anytime you know, a telecommunication company wants to, to do anything overhead to replace a pole, you know, you name it. So, uh, but it's going to set up a, 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 I guess, a complaint process or, you know, if there's an area of concern, you know, the, the telecommunication companies would have to go through the same hearing process at the IURC that, that electric companies have to. Well, so it does give them a, a way to, to voice their concerns and, you know, keeps the telecommunication, telecommunication companies uh, with a vested interest in keeping it out of that IURC hearing. Well, Senator, thank you for coming in. We're out of time. But okay. we're, you get to come back on Friday. All right. We'll, we'll find out what happened this sure. week. Sure. A lot of these will be, uh, have a lot of action this week, I'm sure. And our first show is always uh, a long one because we have a lot to catch up yep. on. Yep. Look forward to seeing okay. you Friday. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Our guest has been State Senator Mark Mesper representing you. Thank you for watching WJTS Inform, where local people watching local people.